Again, I'm, I'm pleased to be here again uh, after 25 years, as uh, Eric has found out uh, 25 years ago. Uh, there was a very similar uh, event going on here. It was in winter time, and uh, I always believed that this is uh, a field uh, <laughs> full of snow. Uh, I had no idea that this, this beautiful lake here. So, uh, I want to talk about democracy, an endless and central topic of what we are doing in political science and uh, sociology. I'm somehow between these two disciplines. Uh, the, uh, I have a paper that I'm going to summarize, and the paper is easily available. At, uh, here and um, um, in, I think 96, uh, 1996, a volume came out uh, with the title Democracy, Its Triumph and Crisis. Triumph, obviously, none democratic systems uh, in uh, Central Eastern Europe, the systems of also in state socialism, had broken down. And um, why crisis? And the authors in that volume, uh, Editor <coughs> Hardinius, uh, discuss uh, various aspects of crisis. The uh, feeling that democracies do not work well, um, that they are uh, deficient, uh, that they need to be uh, improved uh, is widely shared. No one uh, in the academic world, as far as I can see, would claim that uh, the really existing democracy is what uh, the theorists of liberal democracy, from John Stuart Mill to Robert Dahl, have um, uh, envisioned as uh, the ideal. And uh, that is what I want to talk about. Um, and um, it is also uh, a trend in the literature, the academic research uh, in political theory, political science, comparative politics, and, and so on, to think about uh, innovations, improvements. So uh, the simple uh, model of uh, uh, pathologies and remedies. That is what in, is in the background of the uh, paper, uh, and that is what I want to talk about. More specifically, I want uh, to talk about something that uh, is again a new term in political science. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, I think one would hardly find it. Now you have uh, hundreds of articles and dozens of books with this in uh, the title. This, this new term in the title. The new term is, the new concept is deliberation. And um, uh, Eric, together with uh, Alfred Fung, um, uh, have uh, edited one of many volumes on democratic innovations, institutional innovations, new forms of participation, and, and so I want to uh, discuss this. Um, a, a simple question to start with, what in the views of the, uh, of the democratic theorists uh, of the mid-19th to mid-20th uh, century, from Mill to Lips, let's say, um, what uh, uh, have they argued and actually, in one case before that, mm -hmm. what have they argued uh, as an answer to the question, what is democracy good for? And um, I think there are five ways to, uh, to argue for democracy. Um, uh, the, the most parsimonious is uh, uh, to argue that political equality, the principle that all citizens have equal rights in participating 
in the formation and the conduct of governments uh, is a default solution <coughs> because all kinds of um, alternatives have become obsolete, theocratic, party authoritarian, military, dynastic uh, forms of authoritarian rule have become obsolete and therefore only political equality remains as a, a solution. Uh, all uh, citizens of a country should participate in equal terms, on equal terms in the conduct of uh, government. Uh, egalitarianism uh, of political rights is a default uh, position. And uh, in the history of uh, the democratic political systems, you see a progressive elimination of barriers to that ideal. Uh, 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 first gender, uh, 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 then uh, literacy, uh, then tax paying uh, criteria as limitations of equality were eliminated. Two remain significantly, and one is uh, one of the two is one of the two barriers is uh, going to stay with us, causing quite a, a number of interesting problems. Uh, age uh, is one barrier to equal participation. Uh, there is an age limit and nowhere to the best of my knowledge is it below the age of 60. Brazil, uh, Brazil even in the constitution has the age of 16 as uh, the uh, age of active voting. Passive voting is always higher uh, being a candidate for election is always higher age limit than that. But that, uh, there are interesting uh, schemes to overcome that. And the other is residents who are not citizens, cannot vote, cannot have equal political rights uh, uh, beyond the level of local elections. Uh, uh, that is the rule. But other than that, everyone has equal political rights. Uh, now, more ambitious uh, uh, arguments for uh, uh, democracy, equal rights of political participation um, uh, come in, go back to uh, uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, 1795, um, where he argues, per annual peace, where he argues uh, that uh, republics, as he puts it, republics have the great advantage uh, of never conducting wars against other republics. So the spread of republics, or in our modern terminology, democracies, would actually contribute to the preservation of peace. One of the arguments why he is, uh, thought that is so, and I still think mm -hmm. in spite of uh, some evidence and some arguments to the contrary, that this is one of the most robust hypotheses in the history of uh, the social sciences. One argument is that uh, participating, democratically participating constituencies would never be ready to grant war credits if it is a war to, uh, uh, against other uh, democracies. <coughs> a second uh, uh, set of arguments, which I'm only very briefly uh, uh, summarizing here, uh, is uh, the following. Uh, democracies are desirable because they institutionalize conflict. They do not overcome conflict, but they uh, provide rules for the conduct of conflict. And uh, there are three modes of political uh, communication under these institutional rules, which uh, are capable to get taken together to uh, uh, to um, generate compromise 
conflict of conflict and thereby making conflict bearable. Uh, conflict of ideas, conflict uh, of identities, conflict of interests, whatever. These three practices that uh, lead to that desirable um, outcome of taming conflict are uh, voting, bargaining, and arguing, the uh, three modes of political communication that John Elster has uh, distinguished. And uh, they can also help these uh, practices of voting, bargaining, and arguing in public can also help to tame the passions and interests of rulers through mechanisms of accountability. A third argument more demanding uh, for um, a democracy is um, a link, a hypothesized link between um, this is a social democratic hypothesis between democracy and social progress, social and distributional uh, progress. The Keynesian welfare state uh, would uh, organize a permanent positive sum gain uh, and uh, thereby organize distributional progress and approximations to social justice. Uh, this uh, uh, hypothesis, however, has been sharply uh, contradicted by authors uh, that uh, who um, uh, became prominent in the mid 70s of the last century. Most prominent among them, uh, the volume "Crisis of Democracy" 1975, and the article by Samuel Huntington, "Crisis of Democracy," arguing that democracies are self-undermining arrangements, they promise more than they can keep. Uh, they suffer from uh, self-inflicted demand overload. Uh, they give rise to rising expectations. They become incompatible with the requirements of economic stability. They generate inflation, yeah. unemployment, and fiscal imbalance, and therefore are dangerous arrangements. So this is a, an important neoconservative uh, um, disagreement uh, with the mainstream of uh, liberal democracy. Um, and then uh, an age-old uh, false hypothesis about what democracy is good for is that democracy uh, invites participation and participation improves the quality quality of the practice of citizenship. Um, democracy has a favorable formative impact upon citizens and their ability uh, to uh, pass judgment on the um, well-being of the political community. I think these are the arguments, uh, the last one being the Republican argument, versus the social democratic, versus uh, the international, versus the liberal. These are the, the, the labels I would uh, uh, put on uh, these uh, four positions that go beyond the default position, uh, which I mentioned first. My second part, very briefly, equally briefly, I want to, um, I want to uh, discuss structural features, characteristics, defining characteristics of liberal democracy. I have a short list of four. Dahl has seven, uh, Schmidt and Karl have nine. Uh, 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 so, uh, but there is much overlap uh, between them and uh, it, just for the sake of parsimony, I thought we can do this four. Um, uh, okay, first of my defining characteristic. Um, democracies are dependent upon and parasitic upon stateness. Democracies take place in states. And that means we have a lot of um, uh, speculations and uh, utopian proposals about what a 
uh, international democracy or supranational <coughs> democracy might look like, but so far states are the necessary containers of democracy. If you do not have a state, you cannot have a democracy. Um, it is also applies the, the link between stateness, and I elaborate on this uh, briefly in a moment, uh, and democracy uh, has to do with the following. Um, democracies are never state founding. They take place on the territory and among the population of pre-existing states. Uh, de democracies are, by their very nature, successor regimes. They depend upon state capacity uh, that is already there. Uh, and uh, democracies are the result of the democratization of pre-democratic regimes in fixed territories. They often lead, after they have been established, to uh, secessions and separations. But uh, at the beginning of democracies, there is a pre-given uh, state. Um, uh, and if there is no state, or the state is weak, we <coughs> have discussed that yesterday uh, briefly, and the reasons for that, uh, democracy is uh, pointless. And uh, one could also uh, use the example of the EU and its famous democratic deficit. Uh, the EU is not a democracy because it is not a state. It would have to become a state first in order to become a democracy. The leadership of the, or the governing body of the uh, EU is the European Commission. Um, uh, that does not uh, partake in democratic accountability. Uh, the, uh, the composition is not based upon uh, uh, political alternatives, um, uh, and so on. So the link between state and democracy is what interests us here, which is, in the case of EU, a big problem, because 50% of the legislation uh, which determine the life chances of European citizens come through European institutions, the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission. Uh, and uh, the stateness, uh, in spite of the principle of uh, uh, subsidiarity, um, has in a way emigrated to a non-state entity of the EU. There are two uh, 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 processes that have, over the last 30 years, limited the um, capacity of nation states. Uh, one is uh, the delegation of parts of sovereignty to the European level. I'm yeah. talking about Europe here. And, uh, 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 and the, the, the top organizations of the European level that do determine the life chances of every European citizen every day in a very significant way are uh, the European Central Bank, much in the media these days, the European Court of Justice, and the European Commission. Uh, these are uh, beyond any uh, democratic uh, accountability. Um, States are, in a way, disempowered through supranationalization in the case of the EU, and uh, that uh, plays a role for national democracy. In the polemical discourse on the European Union, uh, the uh, EU is sometimes described as an organization of foreign rule, foreign rule that is uh, beyond the reach of national democracy. That is uh, uh, probably going too far, uh, but uh, uh, the sentiment is clearly there. We lose our democracy because um, decisions on important common affairs have 
been delegated and uh, contracted out as it, uh, as it were. Um, and I have uh, talked yesterday about uh, fiscal uh, stress and the dependency upon financial uh, markets uh, and uh, uh, the threat to state capacity that comes from these developments. Uh, but another development worth mentioning in this context, uh, sometimes uh, described as a disorganization of stateness, uh, has to do with the privatization um, and deregulation of major parts of public life. Uh, take an example of railway systems, or of media systems, or of utilities, uh, or of housing. Um, these are matters that used to be uh, under democratic control and have emigrated as a, uh, under the impact of uh, all kinds of uh, uh, political developments over the last 30 years uh, and are beyond the reach of democracy. So the democracies are shrinking as to the, their uh, jurisdiction by two processes. One is the uh, uh, supranationalization and one is the privatization of what used to be under the ju jurisdiction of um, uh, states and their democracy. Uh, to, to overstate the point, democracy becomes useless as a political resource vis-a-vis uh, -vis these uh, developments. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, jurisdiction of uh, uh, governments that originate from democratic uh, elections has uh, shrunk uh, and as a consequence uh, people turn away behavioral consequence of this structural change people turn away become cynical about democratic processes they distrust um, that is very well uh, documented uh, in all surveys of OECD countries, the decline of political trust and political participation. Uh, cynicism, frustration, disaffection, apathy, distrust are the terms that you find uh, in all the surveys. Sometimes Finland is an exception uh, to this, but only for a few years. I mean, they have very robust data. Uh, 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 Russell Dalton, uh, among others, uh, put them together. Uh, there is also uh, a kind of political participation that is non-institutional political participation that appears both on the political left and political right, uh, uh, new social movements uh, and uh, populist forms of non-institutional uh, mobilization uh, or uh, of forms of mobilization that uh, channeled protest without um, aspiring to uh, government uh, positions uh, belongs to the phenomena that are relevant here. Uh, and uh, very important is not just the general decline of political participation, but the uneven decline of political participation. The lower you are in socioeconomic status, the less likely you are to participate in uh, politics due to mechanisms of uniform self-marginalization of the worst of um, the lower classes uh, are uh, not participating in a political institutional game that for many of them seems to appear pointless or are incapable of improving their life chances and uh, the well-being of the community. Uh, a second uh, feature, apart from stateness, is the rule of law uh, uh, that comes with democracy, uh, a defining characteristic which also uh, points to a um, interesting uh, paradox, namely the basic rules of democracies are beyond the reach of democratic decision making. Voting rights are not a matter, they are a constitutional matter, but they are not a matter 
of collective decision making. No one can decide that the minority may not participate in the next elections. Um, uh, there are four categories of rights, as we know, uh, uh, those referring to body and soul, uh, that is physical integrity and uh, religious freedom. Uh, then we have economic rights, property and contract. Then we have political rights, um, which uh, uh, arguably uh, are unequal in this uh, uh, on the thorny problem if we look at uh, uh, political finance is that some people can afford to donate for campaigns and some people cannot afford to finance uh, campaigns. So economic um, differences translate into political power. Um, and uh, uh, the fourth category is positive rights or uh, social rights and so on. And they are all exempt from uh, democratic dispositions. <laughs> there are limitations upon the exercise of political power, and that is what constitutional government and uh, rule of law uh, means. Uh, governments are, through the presence of these principles, rule of law, constitutionalism, um, limited in their exercise of political power. Governments are prevented from doing the wrong thing. Uh, namely interfere, to interfere with the liberties of uh, citizens. But that is also, uh, 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 there are many qualifications to that uh, uh, principle uh, uh, today. And uh, the key term here is secu uh, securitization uh, and uh, the, uh, the suspension of uh, uh, rule of law principles and basic rights in the name of greater sec security. Uh, in all of our countries, we have examples uh, uh, of that. The third element, apart from stateness, uh, constitutionalism, rule of law, is uh, elections and other forms of political competition must be contested. There must be a choice among alternative conceptions of the public good of the political <coughs> community. If there is no such choice, democracy is absent. Um, uh, the democracy described by uh, uh, Simon Martin Lipset as democratic class struggle must offer uh, uh, options, choices, alternatives. And, um, well, no one can guarantee how this, uh, these alternatives uh, uh, come into being, and it is even a matter of uh, debate to what extent in a given situation alternatives uh, are present. There are three kinds of alternatives that we know. Uh, this is all basic uh, political science. Uh, there are alternatives of programs uh, of political uh, parties, entire ideologically uh, shaped uh, conceptions of the common good and the desirable direction of how the community should uh, evolve. Social democracy uh, is an example uh, of this, but also political conservatism is an example. Uh, liberalism, is, it is a, a comprehensive view of how the good order of public affairs should look like. The second type uh, of uh, political conflict and political alternatives has to do uh, with issues, not with programs. Issues, uh, uh, health reform, uh, or uh, public transport, or uh, old age pensions, or uh, fiscal reform, or whatever, um, are uh, uh, addressed in different ways, and different solutions are uh, proposed by different uh, uh, competing political forces, political parties. And the third uh, level of conflict uh, is not among programs, not among issues, but among persons. And uh, there is a clear tendency from program to issue and from issue to persons. Today, 
and not just in presidential systems. Persons are all important. The personalization of competition leads uh, to the uh, uh, rise of populist uh, <coughs> forms of uh, politics, both in the left and the right and the, at the center. Um, and uh, populist politics are defined uh, by uh, a sharp uh, opposition uh, uh, type of enmity uh, between contenders and their opponents. The line between an opponent and an enemy becomes blurred. Enemies can be <coughs> up there, the rich, powerful, the government, the central powers, and they can be down there. And these are uh, then uh, uh, those who commit welfare fraud, a fraud or, uh, or the migrants uh, uh, in a centric uh, movement. So, so a de deformation and of uh, political uh, conflict and uh, contestation uh, can be observed, but we know, and I think it is uncontested, that political conflict, which is to be <coughs> regularized by and institutionalized by uh, democratic uh, processes, uh, must be there. If uh, everyone agrees on everything, uh, there cannot be democracy. And so the fourth element is accountability. Uh, and that is uh, the full list, and I think that is uh, fairly uh, exhaustive and uh, sufficient. Uh, accountability can be vertical through elections uh, and uh, through media. Mass constituencies uh, evaluate in a, a consequential way uh, the conduct of government by elites. Uh, but uh, um, they can also be uh, horizontal and that is what the division of powers uh, is for under constitutionalism. Uh, the Supreme Court or the Higher Court or uh, the Constitutional Court, whatever it's called, controls the conduct of both Parliament and, and um, uh, the executive branch of government. And the Parliament controls the executive and the executive uh, uh, programs the agenda uh, of the legislative uh, branch. And there is this uh, famous um, uh, checks and balances system of horizontal uh, control. The, the problem, however, <coughs> in accountability is that um, the political elites uh, are not just the object, but also the subject uh, of control. They can uh, through opinion uh, surveys, uh, through uh, campaigns and uh, uh, the financial sources that are needed for campaigns, uh, control public opinion and not just public opinion controls. But then there's a mutual uh, relationship of control. Uh, political elites, according to a new uh, uh, perspective that uh, Pierre Cousin Vallon has. Uh, uh, introduce, uh, specialize in th three types of activities. And I, actually, if you watch television uh, or read the papers or uh, see the, uh, watch the thing uh, ongoing in public, 90% uh, of the activities, the speech acts of political elites can be, um, can be coded under one of these three activities. These three, what are the three activities? Uh, blame avoidance. Uh, <laughs> it was not me, it was someone else. Or uh, uh, we have inherited the problem, and it's uh, from the last uh, government. Or it is not us, it is international uh, configurations of course. Blame avoidance. Uh, the second is credit claiming. Uh, so we have done it, and we, uh, this is sufficient, should be sufficient uh, reason to uh, uh, re-elect us. And the third is position taking. Uh, these three uh, activities uh, uh, show up in virtually the entire, these are the basic 
building blocks of political rhetoric. Uh, and uh, they are designed to escape or, or, or uh, uh, take control over those who uh, uh, can and should control uh, the, um, uh, the political elites. Uh, now, uh, I mean, this is very sketchy and, and uh, a summary of, of the first 30 pages, pages of my paper. Um, uh, and uh, there's much more de detail in the, in the paper. What I want to concentrate on is one concept that has uh, that is new and uh, has not widely been used, namely uh, the concept of deconsolidation, the weakness, the withering away, the uh, this uh, uh, disorganization of democratic processes uh, as they. Um, are defined by these uh, four criteria that I have mentioned. Um, uh, again, uh, empirical indicators are the decline of electoral uh, turnout, the bias of uh, socioeconomic status in voting, the, the, the mass activity, the mass activities, I describe the elite activities, the rhetorical elite activities, the mass activities in uh, political participation consists in the following voting, joining, knowing, getting information, discussing, and donating. I think that is fairly complete. And if you look at the uh, indicators, Salt has uh, done a very interesting uh, uh, study on uh, how this developed. Um, all these activities are on the decline. Uh, as is the, the decline of trust in elites and uh, a widely shared sense of powerlessness, frustration. We can't change anything anyway. So why, uh, 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 why getting involved in one of these uh, forms? Uh, so what, what we find as an overall indicator of deconsolidation of uh, liberal democracies is a vast underutilization of political resources. People have the rights, but they are not inclined to make use of the rights uh, because uh, also due to the perceived weakness of stateness, they um, don't think it is worth their, um, uh, their effort in sharp contrast to the interwar period in Europe, uh, there is no significant and uh, even remotely plausible alternative to the liberal democracy. This is why I speak of deconsolidation. The practices uh, do not um, uh, conform to the aspirations, uh, but there is no alternative way uh, widely shared or widely considered as a possibility. There is no new authoritarianism, but it is a, a, a process, a, some people have spoken of a rotting process of democratic institutions. I think that uh, describes our uh, situation. Now the question is, are there remedies? And um, uh, I think there are, uh, I mean, there, there are, uh, Ten books over the last 20 years, last 15 years, on democratic innovations and new practices to revitalize uh, democratic life and to um, come closer to the fulfillment of democratic aspirations. Uh, and the wonderful idea, very original examples of sociological imagination of how you can uh, improve the functioning. And I mentioned just a few of them. Others are, uh, uh, are uh, uh, extensively described uh, in uh, uh, the book by uh, Eric and Arvind um, Poon, uh, but uh, Graham Smith is another uh, book. Uh, something edited by, by Schmitter and Trexer, 
So they are uh, uh, more than 100 uh, well-developed and uh, partly highly original proposals how to improve the operation of uh, democracy. And let me conclude by discussing um, uh, some of them. There are two families uh, of uh, proposals for improvement. One is, and definitely the older one, the, the more developed one, the um, better established one, um, provides answers of the question, how can we make sure that the will of individual citizens or the will of the people is better transmitted, better expressed, more stringently uh, represented in political life? How can participation be made meaningful and therefore motivated? And uh, how can the values, preferences, opinions, ideas, and interests of uh, individuals uh, be energized so as to make a difference, uh, both a difference in the stringency of control uh, and the uh, appro approximation of uh, values of uh, uh, freedom uh, and social justice. Uh, uh, social justice. Okay, that is uh, that is the first family. Just to illustrate, um, and that goes back to the uh, literature of the 60s and 70s on uh, participatory democracy. How can participation be strengthened and made more meaningful? Uh, you can facilitate collective action and uh, make association uh, for political purposes easier. Uh, you uh, establish democracy in other areas than public policy, for instance, in schools, universities, and uh, enterprises, companies, through co-determination practices. You uh, increase the number of cases to which direct democratic practices apply through uh, substantive uh, referenda on uh, issues um, yeah, of all uh, sorts, particularly uh, issues of uh, uh, public spending on uh, infrastructure investment, on the location of uh, train stations, uh, 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 projects as, as uh, TBA. Uh, 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 airports uh, and so on, um, or um, uh, m a more original idea is the idea that uh, uh, was originally uh, developed by Philip Schmitter on representation vouchers. Right? You get tax deductible or tax financed uh, amounts of. Uh, say $200 per year per citizen, and uh, these, uh, uh, this, this money can be voted into the budgets of uh, voluntary associations in civil society, be it bird watchers or be it metal workers uh, organizations, uh, um, uh, representation vouchers, uh, or uh, the rule of uh, uh, changing the, the electoral law, uh, there are series uh, of electoral laws, and one that is least uh, uh, institutionalized and most promising uh, is a single transferable vote on which the uh, British Columbia Citizen Convention uh, was held. Uh, or you have uh, the uh, old but revived proposal uh, of vicarious voting for um, underage citizens, that is children and uh, the young. Uh, every uh, father gets an uh, extra vote for every daughter, every mother, for every son. And um, 
uh, that would deviate from the principle of equality, but uh, <coughs> incorporate those citizens who are not yet able and entitled uh, to vote. Fifty others I, I could mention uh, that belong in this um, category. The first bundle of my uh, uh, remedies, mm. which have to do with the improvement uh, of transmission and expression of preferences to political elites. The second bundle, on which I'm uh, speaking for the rest of my talk, uh, has to do not with the better expression and transmission of preferences, but the better formation of preferences. Improvements at the level of preference building rather than preference uh, expression. Um, and uh, uh, these remedies uh, are uh, premised upon the assumption that opinions, preferences, interests, the definitions are not simply there. They are not given. They are not exogenous. But they are constantly in flux in a constant process of production. They are formed in interaction with others. In order to find out what I want, I need to know first what others want. And then uh, I can uh, make a decision whether I join them or not in my definition of interests and uh, preferences. And, uh, so it is a formative process of uh, uh, preferences, which uh, so far uh, lacks any institutional shell in which it uh, uh, takes place. And also, uh, preferences are uh, highly information sensitive. And as uh, information and attention is scarce, uh, our preferences are incomplete. Um, I do not have, or did not have until recently, uh, me speaking as a person, um, uh, preferences uh, on um, primary school reform. Uh, but as I have a grandson who is now attending <coughs> primary school, uh, I begin to think about these things. Uh, and you, I have not done so for a long time, and I'm uh, educating myself with the help of others about what the alternatives are and what the uh, experiences are and what experts think about this. and. Uh, uh, what political parties have proposed in the past and, and uh, presently. So uh, my preferences are both in flux and incomplete. And there are many, most people, most of the time, do not have a clear, distinct preference on most issues that are somewhere on the table. Right? I mean, uh, uh, agricultural subsidies is something that I'm much too ignorant to, to express a, an opinion about. Right? I have to rely on others, or I have to undergo a demanding process of preference formation. And I rely on others. I depend on others in that process. It would be, I mean, the, the quality of what a political preference or opinion is, uh, uh, is uh, if we are minimally demanding on that, it depends on, on information. And these uh, two processes, making complete preferences and upgrading, validating, uh, uh, learning about our preferences in interaction with others, are summarily referred to as deliberation. I, uh, the formation of interest is a process that uh, uh, is very poorly institutionalized. Democrats tend to believe that people do have opinions and preferences uh, about uh, important issues, and that is by far not uh, a guarantee that, that, that this is. And if it is, it is a, the result, the outcome of a process of preference uh, formation. A good example is in last week's New York Times magazine, where the former editor-in-chief of uh, the New York Times uh, explains um, uh, 
with some uh, pain uh, why he has changed his opinion on the Iraq war. He was a, a ardent supporter of the <coughs> Iraq war when it started, but now he finds out that uh, his preferences has changed and he gives reasons why this is so from experience, but he also uh, gives reasons that could have played a role at the time when he formed his original preference. It's first uh, uh, and uh, so uh, it is a kind of autocritic. Um, and uh, just as a footnote, uh, what we are talking about, the formation of preferences, is exactly what Stephen Lux in his 2005 book refers to as the third phase of power, uh, namely the absence of autonomous judgment formation and the conditions under which we find out which interests we share with whom. And uh, uh, deliberation could be defined as the overcoming of or the balancing of the neutralization of the third phase uh, of power. Uh, so the, the argument is that many more institutional opportunities uh, are present to express uh, preferences than exist to form, test, validate, and revise preferences. Whether or not we admit that we were wrong in what we preferred yesterday, uh, uh, if we do that, uh, it is uh, the strength of our conscience or the desire to be consistent with oneself, uh, rather than and the institutional process. And the question uh, is, uh, can that uh, limitation or this imbalance between expression and formation of preferences uh, be changed? Uh, uh, Bob Goodin has the often quoted uh, formula preference laundering um, or refining or upgrading or validating of one's own uh, preferences. Uh, the older literature, philosophical literature, refers to a phenomenon that um, uh, is called uh, having meta preferences. Uh, that is, the preference have different preference than I actually have. Uh, this this, this self-critical uh, uh, attitude. And whoever uh, tries to develop these ideas is confronted with the argument, you are telling people that they have a false consciousness. This paternalistic uh, uh, assumption and the rejection uh, of this line of uh, thought, that it's wrong. Uh, the uh, argument of false con consciousness uh, is uh, uh, not to be uh, dismissed, uh, but <coughs> we ourselves have to discover that our consciousness is wrong or has been wrong in the past. We do not want to be told by others in a paternalist way, uh, what is right and what is uh, wrong uh, 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 consciousness. So this process, uh, the question is, can that be institutionalized? And uh, people who have pursued that question, I think most prominent is uh, Jim Fishkin in the United States, uh, have done experiments of attitude change through communication. Um, they uh, uh, describe this as deliberative falling, uh, you uh, have a group of people, you ask them on, on a, a list of items, their opinion, and then let, let them discuss and let them absorb information on these items. And at the end of the afternoon, after a few hours, you will take the poll again and see significant changes. Uh, that I didn't know, one person would say. And had I known this before, I would never have have expressed the preference that I have expressed four hours ago. Right? These um, uh, changes. Uh, uh, and the question is can they be organized? Um, 
Um, and uh, the answer is uh, yes. Um, and uh, there are several books, Fishkin, Fishkin and Ackermann, uh, and others uh, on this, uh, the organization of such processes. The, the uh, most important and most consequential example of which was a, a uh, procedure organized by the former governor of the province of uh, British Columbia uh, in the early 2000s uh, on electoral uh, reform in that particular uh, province, the British Columbia um, Citizen Convention, uh, it was called. So, uh, uh, the functions of uh, these uh, um, deliberative polls are as follows. Um, they give the opportunity to change preferences on the basis of new information and the awareness of what others uh, think and uh, prefer and the interaction with others. And it can also result uh, that I have the preferences that I had before, but I have validated, I have better arguments for keeping, holding fast to the preference I have. It can also uh, be used beyond that as a form of soft power. Once the preferences and preference changes after this institutional laundry of preferences are published, uh, the rulers will know about what is going on uh, and uh, they will be influenced by this. It can also uh, overcome the uh, uh, unequal participation or participatory inequality that I have referred to by widening the social inclusion of the participants in the process through random selection of participants. Um, and uh, finally, um, uh, it can uh, be demonstrated, and there are uh, fine grained recent studies on that, that uh, the attitude change or the preference change that takes place through such organized processes of uh, uh, preference re revision is not random, uh, uh, but it uh, tends to change in a direction that can be broadly described as left liberal and cosmopolitan. People who have uh, based their preferences on resentments and um, uh, a private, and narrow, and short-sighted definition of their interests open up to become more inclusive in their preferred policy solution. The structure of such uh, uh, institutions uh, um, is um, uh, can be described by three characteristics. First, <laughs> there's an alternative in the first. Either you have open access. Whoever wants to participate can participate in these deliberative fora. And that is uh, uh, the case, for instance, with the uh, participatory budgeting <coughs> proposals in Brazil which have uh, spread to 200 cities in Brazil and uh, are also experimented with in various places in your open access. Whoever is present can raise his or her voice. Or alternative and preferably probably uh, random uh, selection rather than self-selection. Uh, random selection as it was practiced to a large extent, not 100%. Uh, in the British uh, Columbia uh, experiment. Secondly, um, uh, you need um, what is called facilitators. That is, people who uh, moderate uh, debates on preferences, see to it that, equal, uh, that uh, uh, information is not just presented, but understood and absorbed see to it that every position taken uh, uh, needs to uh, be accompanied by a reason why this position is taken, <laughs> by the person who takes the uh, position. 
and uh, sees to it that the quality of participation is maintained. Not one person speaking all the time, uh, uh, but uh, all participants uh, 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 actually uh, raising their voice in, therefore, necessarily relatively small uh, groups. Um, and um, uh, the third uh, uh, structural feature of such uh, deliberative fora of preference formation would consist uh, in the promise given by political elites and the promise that can be enforced that the outcomes of the deliberative process will not be inconsequential. We'll listen to what all of us find out about what the best policy is. Then the seriousness of involvement, the seriousness of debate will increase. So that this uh, is what I had to say. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your I'll relieve you of the burden of keeping track of who seems chafing at the bit. So I will, uh, I will moderate the discussion. I seem to always chafe at the bit. I know, you're a, a real chafer. You know. <laughs> or a real bit. <laughs> um, I'm struck by two characteristics of your examples. One is the, uh, if you will, the utilitarian kinds of issues you mentioned, where to put the electric power plant, uh, transportation, age pensions, um, and the absence of any cultural issues like language policy, national, uh, whether or not to permit bilingual education, that's on one hand. And quite related to that is the way you discussed your remedies, which seem to uh, be quite, uh, presume an ad atomistic citizens, the individual citizens participating. So I guess what I'm asking is, how does your thinking about this bear on, or how can it be made to incorporate communal cultural issues? Well, uh, I mean, whenever you enter in a, uh, in a, a debate of this uh, type, you should not idealize the situation. I, I mean, it is far from an ideal speech uh, situation. Mm -hmm. People come with, uh, I mean, cognitive handicaps and uh, prejudices and uh, uh, conceptions of uh, about uh, 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 who they are and who the others are and uh, what the distance between, between them is and, and that applies certainly to cultural issues. I mean, should we have integrated schools or should we have uh, schools uh, that at an earlier point uh, differentiate between uh, different levels of uh, uh, achievement and, and so on. But uh, at the same time, once you are asked to give reasons for uh, what you prefer, uh, then you can uh, not respond in a total logical way. I think that way because I think that way. That is not good enough. Or because it is my case. Uh, or because it has always been the case. Uh, so the awareness of uh, 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 conflict, the awareness of contingency, there are always other solutions possible, uh, uh, forces, and that is an Habermasian argument, uh, uh, to uh, reflect upon reasons that others can accept. If I'm confronted to, uh, to others who sit around the same table, and I know they are of an entirely different background, than me, then I have to uh, to make an argument to the effect that um, my point of view must be acceptable to you. And that is a, a, a considerable and uh, potentially painful effort uh, to make. And uh, I think cultural issues 
uh, we do not live in a in a in a cocoon, uh, in a cultural cocoon of uh, uh, religious or ethnic or uh, linguistic. Um, uh, we need to open up. In, if we want to defend the cocoon, we need to open the cocoon. Uh, in order uh, to make uh, our point of view, my point of view, accessible to others. At least they must understand why I think the way uh, I do. And if I make that effort to make them understand, I think differently than uh, uh, from the point of view of my identity. Right? So I, th I think that it is uh, uh, coincidental that I have uh, skipped cultural examples uh, here um, uh, that applies, I mean, the possibility, I think, of deliberative uh, <coughs> upgrading of preferences applies as much to interests like pension reform or utilitarian cases as it applies uh, to to uh, your cultural issues. I just wonder if the cultural issues are more likely to trigger the uh, being concerned with what you call the overall program, even though you put it in terms of social democracy, mm -hmm. but, but pluralism, assimilation <laughs> versus whatever, um, as distinct from what you call the issues. That is, they, they, what's at stake in those may be different and still subject to what you said, mm -hmm. but where they end up more, more going, yeah. where they take you may be different. Okay. It's ultimately the empirical question what, what happens in these discourses. Uh, and. Um, I don't see uh, the necessity of assuming uh, that different kinds of issues uh, are uh, not uh, equally open to self revisions uh, of the kind that I've described. Um, Rogers, you had your hand up. Klaus, I'm much more skeptic than a uh, mm -hmm. skeptic of. Uh, um, P. Schmitter and, and Fishkin's and others' views that there are real remedies uh, to some of the <coughs> facing uh, democracy. And, and the reason is that uh, I think we are increasingly nested in a multi-level world. Uh, there's the uh, global world, there is the transnational uh, uh, world, the European Union uh, and the like. There's the nation state, uh, there are the provincial or local states and the like. And at any given moment, we are uh, constantly influenced by actors and actions that are going on at all these levels. And I don't think we really have a, a theory of democracy that permits us to cope with participation and, and uh, to deal with all these levels simultaneously. So of course, this reason that I am very skeptical uh, that there are these remedies. Or okay. Now, you had focused very much, it seems to me, uh, at the state, the community, yes. uh, the territory. And so I'm really focusing on multi levels. Right, but uh, as I said at the beginning, um, states uh, are a precondition for the universe. Statehood, uh, that is, in agency that is uh, legitimate and effective uh, uh, is presupposed in all the theories of democracy. International democracy that they would help rights about uh, uh, is something uh, that the institutional contours of which, and I agree very much with you, we do not know. Uh, and I mean, is the United Nations a democratic organization? <coughs> It's certainly not a, a global government. And um, so uh, I think it all depends, and that is a limitation of such an approach, but also a limitation of democracy. Uh, uh, all the things I've talked about take place in states that are uh, uh, reasonably capable states. 
uh, and if that's, uh, as, if citizens have to decide on state policies, uh, they have their preferences and uh, conceptions of interest, and if that uh, is what uh, are the important determinants of state policies, be it at the local, uh, provincial, or regional, or lender level, or be it at the national level, uh, then these preferences can be uh, changed through a process of uh, uh, interactive reflection or deliberation, as I uh, described it. And there are many, uh, many examples. I mean, uh, I refer uh, in passing to uh, a case in Germany where a railway station uh, in Stuttgart, the city of Stuttgart, uh, uh, is to be uh, uh, rebuilt. Uh, underground, that at a cost of uh, 6.8 billion euro, uh, and the local population, uh, uh, that has uh, been decided largely outside of the public discourse. Uh, this is modern, and this is uh, more rail uh, traffic, and that is uh, uh, environmentally uh, safe. And, and now the question came up in a, in a massive way, with massive demonstrations and confrontations. Uh, after this, this decision was made to, to, to put this railway, big railway station underground, uh, is that worth the effort? Is that worth so much money? Uh, also, uh, is it worth uh, uh, getting rid of this uh, uh, the symbol of the history of the city? And, uh, and, so and uh, uh, a deliberative uh, uh, forum was uh, uh, installed uh, to reconsider the issue. And uh, uh, even a compromise was found, but uh, it was too late to be implemented. And now we wait what's, uh, what's going to happen. And uh, some proposed to hold a referendum, and some uh, uh, say that. Uh, it will cost uh, 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 several hundred million euros in contractual fines, right? If you do not build what has been agreed upon, then one party has to pay that. And is that worth uh, the cost of revision of that? So it's, it's up in the air. But it is not uh, uh, impossible, even with such giant projects, uh, to uh, um, through the entirely informal influence of these debates to change political <coughs> decisions. And uh, it, is, it goes through all levels. I mean, the, the federal government mm -hmm. pays parts of the uh, amount, the, the state, the city, uh, uh, the railway company, and they are all involved. And, and they are, it's a multi uh, stakeholder uh, affair which has been significantly uh, slowed down, at least, uh, for the time being. I don't know the, the, the result through these uh, interventions of deliberative uh, decision-making or opinion and preference formation, which has a great impact. I mean, if this was televised for dozens of hours, the debates in this deliberative group of uh, of 20 people uh, representing all the stakeholders, but not the citizens, the stakeholders were uh, represented. And uh, the end is uh, quite open, in spite of your multi level complexity that you uh, rightly refer to. Uh, Matt, and then I'm going to keep my eye out for students um, more than for faculty, but you know, I'll be gentle to the faculty. Too. <laughs> you pointed out that. Um, there are these big structural things going on that are reducing the scope of democracy, especially supranationalization and privatization, mm -hmm. and then offer a series of mechanisms for deepening democracy that I heard to be over those parts that are, that, that are left. Those, um, I mean, it doesn't seem on their face that these forms of these ideas for deliberation would address the bigger structural issues. Maybe I'm wrong, and you can yeah, explain it to me, but yeah. how do we? How, we have deeper deliberation over an ever smaller number of things. How do we go after okay, the bigger okay. structures now? Very good point. Very good point. And I have no, no really compelling answer to, to that. Uh, 
of course you can say uh, it would be worthwhile to um, uh, to supranationalize the liberative fora as well. And uh, Jim Pischke drew that conclusion. He actually flew to uh, uh, Brussels, uh, 200 or 320, I think it was, representatives from all 27 member states to let them hold a, a, a deliberative forum on important aspects of uh, this even a uh, uh, documentary movie that shows this um, uh, on, uh, on various uh, policy issues of the European Union. Uh, and that was, uh, I mean, a complicated process, all the logistics and all the linguistic problems that they needed to talk to each other in, in uh, 23 different languages. Uh, uh, but it, uh, it worked out and that led uh, not only to a significant shift of preferences and opinions among the participants, but it has also led to, uh, uh, well, uh, the attention uh, and the, uh, uh, the respectful consideration of the outcomes by the European authority. So it, it is, uh, I think, ideally it should move up to to the uh, upper level, a similar problem uh, as uh, what uh, Rogers just mentioned. But I, I think it is not to be excluded. It's, it is enormously costly. Deliberative procedures are time consuming and logistically demanding. Uh, and uh, uh, Graham Smith, in his recent 2009 book, has a, has a uh, I mean, it takes that in full consideration. You cannot do that on every minor uh, uh, affair. You really important conflicts need to be addressed in this way. And it's, uh, well, democracy itself is uh, uh, costly. Uh, and maybe it's worth <coughs> this investment. But um, Rahul. Do not I do not have a solution beyond that. Hi. I would also like to be attentive to um, the gender distribution of participation, which so far <laughs> seems to be uh, along uh, yeah. one homogeneous yeah. dimension of this, uh, of course, arbitrary binary, but Rahul. So, uh, at least if you're bracketing aside uh, Matt's objection, within the, the restricted scope of dom domestic democracy, you seem to be suggesting that these sort of good results of deliberative democratic experiments hold out some sort of lesson or hope for the remediation of the ills of democracy, the other ills of democracy mm -hmm. described, the liberal yeah. mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, I find it, I find it basically impossible to share that optimism. And I think you actually, you, you laid out quite admirably the very reasons why those results are almost completely inapplicable to actual democratic processes in existing societies. So you take your, your, three, your, your three basic conditions. First of all, random selection, which is fundamental at least to the Fishkin style uh, experiments. In, in actual you know, free association in democratic societies, increasingly what happens instead is that when people get together to discuss issues, they're, they're highly sorted by ideological preference with the sort of well-documented results of extremization of views through competitive outfitting processes, or just the opposite of what, what putatively happens in the Fishman style of Australia. Secondly, and I think most importantly, those things are fundamentally dependent on the kind of facilitation. I mean, I think there, there yeah. are several things that are important. One is, that very often when there's a matter of serious information, there are presentations by experts. And in the setup of the whole thing, these people, their expertise is basically is, is taken for granted and is supposed to be accepted. They may not be in the same ideological position, but they speak about things in the, in, in the same intellectual universe. You don't have one expert and one guy whose entire expertise is in trying to come up with spurious arguments to undermine the expert consensus on the issue. Unlike, say, for example, if you set up something on 
climate change in the United States, where you would have exactly this sort of thing, right? So that's another thing. You, you have this idea that you have to couple statements of preference with reasons. That assumes that there's some, uh, there's some agreement on uh, reasons and logical processes connecting facts and arguments, which again is completely, in, you know, not even in the picture as far as I can tell, in, for example, most uh, democratic discussions in the United States. Uh, and is increasingly, in some things, I think, not in the picture in, in Europe as well. Uh, and you have you have the, you have an agreement uh, that you start out with that the sort of basic underlying rules of what what is the process of discussion and what is the process of deliberation are there and not to be questioned. And again, if you look at it, you know try to go uh, as a guest on a Fox News show to take an extreme example, but not one that's that's not unrepresentative. And uh, again, you'll find that the, those rules are all sort of thrown by the wayside. So they're, mm -hmm. they're all completely undermined. Lastly, the, the idea that uh, your opinion will actually matter, mm -hmm. and that it matters that you process evidence and, and come to a decision. Well, even in the most ideal case, for, the, for most people, it is never going to be the case that there is this sort of connection between them and every issue of importance. I mean, you may be undertaking a, a considerable study of issues regarding primary schools, mm -hmm. but there is simply no way that everyone, that even every one of the you know, intellectual class or educated class can do that on a wide variety of issues. Everyone is going to fundamentally remain dependent on signals, mostly having to do with ideological identification. You know, some politician you like, the political party you like says something, and that's how you decide what, what your preference is, is upon that. I don't see any way to change it. I don't see anybody actually trying to get around that themselves, whether on the left or the right. I mean, I have a great deal of difficulty voting in Democratic primary election, local elections, because I don't know who the candidates are and I don't care. And there's no signals on the ballot if, if it's a you know, if it's a general election, then I can look for a D instead of an R by the name. But otherwise, and, you know, so at every level, no matter how how much you try to learn, there is never going to be any sense that it make it's useful to try to form an opinion about all the issues that are actually important. Okay. Uh, well, I'm I'm uh, I'm not famous <laughs> for excessive optimism. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, I specialize I'm, in the optimism. <laughs> But in that case, I would, uh, would take a more uh, uh, optimistic uh, uh, perspective. Maybe there are very important differences uh, that I'm, I'm interested in studying these days between uh, the public sphere in Europe and the United States. Uh, I mean, the, ideal, the level of ideological polarization that I observe in the United States and official uh, discourses uh, is not uh, the same uh, in most cases in Europe. Uh, and um, I think the, uh, uh, so the, uh, the ideological packages represented to, by the two uh, political parties uh, are uh, uh, more easily to untie in, in uh, Europe. <coughs> I mean, all, all parties have the currenti about uh, their, their uh, factions and groups and, uh, <coughs> and uh, the groups uh, agree more than the party uh, leadership on many issues but not on others and, and so on. So the openness of uh, collective opinion formation uh, and the uh, availability of um, mediating positions or perspectives or uh, uh, the capacity for self-doubt uh, may be at the moment uh, somewhat greater in Europe than it is, uh, than I perceive it in the United States. Uh, uh, but uh, beyond that, I would say uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, people tend to discuss political issues with people whom they suspect to have the similar, if not the same, opinion on this. And they seek uh, validation through. Uh, associating and discussing with the likes of myself. Right? That is a, a uh, tendency of human nature. 
to quote uh, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, but um, uh, it is also the case that we encounter and cannot uh, avoid encountering in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, professional, private uh, contact with other people, difference. Uh, and we need to deal with that difference. Uh, we cannot uh, look the other way. We need to address differences and try to come to, a, um, uh, to an understanding which does not uh, end in consensus. And most of these processes do not end in consensus. But after I have gone through a um, uh, encounter of this, this kind, I know more precisely and with better reasons why I take the position I take. And uh, uh, in that way, uh, uh, a validation or refinement or, uh, uh, I mean, Albert Hirschbaumann says that the problem is not to be right, the problem is to raise the level of the debate. Right? Uh, and uh, that will certainly follow uh, from uh, uh, such uh, institutionalized forms of deliberation. I mean, uh, uh, Akamane Fishkin uh, proposed a, um, they, they call a national deliberation day. And this, this is the institution. One day, an, uh, a national issues conference. So the presidential candidates will say, what are the four issues that will be relevant in the, over the next four years or the next eight years for our nation? And uh, these issues uh, are defined by the uh, contenders for power, but they are uh, processed through deliberation in a public, visible uh, process uh, in such fora. And the results and the disagreement, the failure to find a result, a consensus result, uh, will be uh, published. That would uh, uh, enrich uh, the process of, uh, I, I mean, at least it's worth the, uh, the experimentation. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, also what you say about experts is, is right. Experts disagree along ideological, uh, and that is their mission. I mean, they are nominated as experts because they help to provide arguments for me that help me and not uh, the opponents. But then there are more than one experts. And let the experts uh, debate the field of expertise, for instance, in the field of energy or climate or security issues, uh, which are uh, in the center of, uh, uh, of political debates in the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, uh, let uh, the audience uh, debate the value and the, the, the plausibility of the uh, arguments presented by experts. So experts can be deprived of the authority of their expertise by listening to other experts and, and then uh, uh, let the audience form an opinion.